When I was a small child, I was a big Michael Jackson fan, and he had a microphone like this, so <laughs> this is great. <laughs> um, so my, my name is Bastian Künzel. I, I live in Wrocław, and I'm a partner in a small training agency called Incontro. And, and that's what I do. I, I plan and I run trainings and, and seminars and the like. And so I think a lot about learning. And on one hand, I think a lot about learning because I organize the way how people learn when they are participating in something that I've organized. But I also spend a lot of time in, in education, like I guess most of you. And to the large part, education for me looked like this. I was sitting behind a table, and someone was standing in front of the room and was talking things that I needed to learn about. Right? And, and it looked like this for most of my formal education, but also throughout my university education. And, um, and I learned some things, but I think I could have learned much more in this time if it would have been organized slightly differently. I also, in my youth, became really active in, in an international youth organization, and suddenly learning to me looked like this. I was having fun, and I was meeting people from all over the world, and we were playing games with each other, and we were discussing with each other, and we were discovering things together, and we were talking about all kinds of things. We were trying out all kinds of ideas, and a lot of them failed utterly, but we learned so many things in the process. And, and I loved it so much that I started to study intercultural communication and adult education and turned this hobby of mine into my job. And, and now I've been working with a lot of other fellow trainers and, and teachers and so on, and, and I've never met a person that didn't love what they do. They didn't want their students not to learn. But still, there seems to be something that stops people to learn when this process is being organized in a way that somehow doesn't work so well. And, and I think this is because a lot of educators and trainers are stuck in their way. As somehow something stops them from looking to other places or other ways how to organize this learning process. And, and I think that is why we learn so much less in school than we could, and why we learn so much less in conferences or in seminars than we potentially could. And, I mean, one question that pops to mind then is that, do we actually need innovation in education or in, in learning in general? Because, I mean, all of you probably went to some form of education, and you all seem to be doing pretty well. But um, I think we need education to be doing better because we don't address a lot of the challenges that we have as a society or as a community, we don't really address them well enough. We need more creative, more critical, more innovative people to come out of the formal education system and to also come out of, of business trainings uh, because the problems that we as a community and as a society need to address need those kinds of people much more than anything else. So how do we go about this? That's the second question. How do we do this innovation in education? And I think, of course, on one hand, we need to have this wish for, for innovation. We need to realize that something has gone wrong and do it better. But I think uh, another thing that we need, I think we need a good theory. And what do I mean with we need a good theory? To me, a good theory lets you look at reality and see something in it that you haven't seen before, right? A good theory lets you look at something that you know, lets you look at the reality that you know, and see something that you haven't realized before. And a good example of this is the, the table of elements in chemistry. It's, it's been developed when not all of the elements were known. Right? It was, to the large part, empty when it was drawn up. But because it made so much sense, it allowed people to look at the right places and find these elements that were missing in this table of, um, of elements in the per per periodic table. 
And a couple of years, I came across a theory that did this for me in education. It was a, it was a theory that, or it was a study made by, by three British researchers in 2003 that looked at the differences between formal education and non-formal or informal education. And what they concluded was that it doesn't make much sense to just look at these categorically and say this is formal education and this is non-formal education, but to, to look at a couple of different dimensions and describe actually what is going on there. And it's called the learning continuum. And a continuum is, a, is something that happens between two extremes or between, between several extremes. And the, and the learning continuum looks at a couple of dimensions when it comes to education and how we organize it. So the, the first dimension is why. Why are people there? What's the purpose? What is the need that is being addressed by these people being there? And, and what do they need answered by being there? The second dimension is the context or the setting. So where does it take place? How does it look like there? What can happen well there and what can't happen so well there? How are the chairs and tables organized? How many people are there? And so on and so forth. This is how we can describe the setting and the context. The, the fourth dimension is the content. So what is it that is being talked about? And the, and the fourth dimension, finally, is then the process. So what happens first, what happens second and third, and so on and so forth. How do people move in time and space and, and the like? How does the process look like? Now we can look at these four dimensions and, and look at these, the extremes of the learning continuums on, the, on these dimensions. So when we, when we look at formal education, the, the purpose of, of formal education typically is certification. So you certify that someone has been at a certain place for a, a certain time, has been exposed to a certain amount of information, and somehow was able to reproduce them at some point in this process as well. The context typically is a building that has been built and designed for education to take uh, place in them, so schools or universities. Typically, they have the furniture arranged in a certain way that a lot of people can see a single person talk about something. The content typically is universal knowledge, so mathematical rules or um, grammatical rules, historical facts, theorems, and so on and so forth. And, and the process typically has to do with people absorbing knowledge that has been predefined or has been written down somewhere, and they absorb this knowledge, try to put it in their brains, and at some point do something with it at a later stage. In non-formal education, the purpose is to, to make the world a better place, right? The purpose is to have less discriminatory societies, to empower minorities, to essentially make a a world where everyone can participate in a good way. The, the context, well, typically people sit in a circle in non-formal education. People sit in a circle and discuss something, or it takes place in youth centers, or in seminar rooms, and so on and so forth. The, the content has a, is often in non-formal education, things to do with human rights, or with, with solidarity, with empowering people, and the, the process it's often very interactive, and people engage with each other, and they discuss with each other, and they explore things together, and they make experiences together, and through those experiences, learn something. Informal education or informal learning, typically the purpose is to answer a very immediate need, right? And a need that is very personal, typically. So let's go through it in this example, because Typically, in non-formal education, uh, in informal learning, it can take place anywhere. It can take place wherever you are, and probably when you guys came in here, maybe some of you had to already learn something about this place here in order to satisfy a very personal need of yours. And, and when you're in Poland, the content of the thing that you need to learn about in this case is what does a triangle mean and what does a circle mean? mean? It took me quite a while to figure this out and quite a lot of embarrassing situations. But um, nonetheless, there is always a content to learning. It can be where's the gate at the airport or where is uh, the, the door to, to go to a certain place or whatever. It's always 
uh, something that you need to know about in order to, to address uh, an immediate problem that you have. And the process typically has a lot to do with just thinking or, or searching or looking for something or having a conversation with someone. But it's not a purposefully planned process of education, yet most of what we learn, we learn through these informal processes. So, so what? What does this mean? How can we use this learning continuum in actually innovating in, in education? And I think we can use it for two things. I think we can use it on one hand to understand innovation that has already taken place in education, but we can also learn it to plan learning processes for other people, where if we are teachers, if we are trainers, or if we are working in the human resources department of a company and need to organize trainings for the employees. We can use this to plan and look ahead. So let's look at two examples of uh, of how this learning continuum can be, be used to understand innovation in education. And one example that I really love is the Khan Academy. I hope all of you know about it. If not, there's a TED Talk, of course. And so you should definitely listen to this and watch this. So essentially, the Khan Academy is YouTube videos on math, right? And, and people can look at these free of charge, and there's hundreds and thousands of them. And what happens is that students and pupils that don't understand so much about math in school go and look at these videos and look at them over and over and over again, and finally they understand some of the procedures you need to go through to solve math problems. And, and it's become completely viral, and now it's a big uh, organization actually that does this. And what also some teachers have done, some really good teachers, have turned around their teaching and are using this to let pupils watch these videos at home, and then they use the classroom to actually discuss and work with each other and use all the brains that are in this room at a certain time. So we can look at this example through the prism of the learning continuum, and what we see is that they have, on one hand, this really formal purpose to help pupils do well in school, and they also have this really formal content of mathematical rules and formulas. But where we can understand the, the power of this approach is that they changed the context. They took it out of the classroom and they put this in people's living rooms, in bedrooms, on kitchen tables, in the park, in a cafe or wherever. Really informal context. And they use also this really informal process of kids looking at YouTube videos, which means that they can pause any time they want. They can watch them as often as they want. They can make comments. They can they have more control over how they uh, consume this, this contents, which they wouldn't have in a classroom. They can't pause the teacher, rewind, and let them explain the same thing 20 times. With a YouTube video, they can. So this is where we can understand the power of the Khan Academy through the prism of the learning continuum. Another really cool example from non-formal education is the human library, Żywa Biblioteka in, in Polish. And Again, if you don't know about it, I think the, the presentation just crashed. We might uh, need some technical assistance here. Daniel, your computer died. OK, so the, <laughs> the, the Jiva Biblioteca, let me quickly explain to you what it is. So it's a human rights um, event. Fantastic, thank you. It's a human rights education event. And you go to a library and um, you borrow a book. But the book is a person. And the book is a person that belongs to a, a, a group of people that face discrimination in society. And you can borrow this person and have a conversation for 30 minutes and get to know the, the person behind this label that they're being discriminated about. And here we can, again, look at it through this prism of the learning continuum and see that the purpose is very non-formal. It's making the community better. It's empowering minorities. It's creating an atmosphere of dialogue between majority and minority groups. But they put this in a formal context of a library. And they do it with an informal content of someone else's life. And they do it with this informal process of having a conversation with someone that is completely unfacilitated by an educator or by a trainer. 
And here again, looking at these two examples through the learning continuum, we can see what made these so powerful, what made them different to previous approaches to teaching math or to making the world a better place, right? And we can use it to look at also the future and plan seminars or trainings, because in the reality, it's not that, that we stay in one of these extremes, but that we have to constantly shift between them in order to make the best possible learning environments for people. And I would like to give you one example that I've recently been involved with, was, was a, a training for a, a company, a company that wanted to move from the way how they've been working from a more traditional way of working to a more modern way of working, right? And we had a lot of books and theories and a lot of information that we wanted to, to uh, transmit to the people, to the participants that were participating in the Samina. But what we tried to do by looking through this, through the prism of the learning continuum, was that we didn't only do this in the seminar room, but we also did it in people's offices, and we did it in the production area of this company, because these were the places that made the most sense to think about something or to discuss something that in order to achieve this purpose. And we did it through experiences, through exercises where people were building things like this uh, spaghetti tower, but also through formal inputs and also through people working in small groups and solving problems together. Because these were the processes that made in those places, in those settings, on that content, the most sense to achieve that particular purpose. And we did it because of the assumption that, that we learn best, or at least I know I learn best, and I think all of you, if you think back to an example of where you really learned something meaningful, it was probably because the purpose and the context and the content and the process of this learning were in balance with each other. And that is, I think, a way how we can transform education, not only the formal education in schools and universities, but also anywhere where people can learn. Because wouldn't it be great if we could take a step back and look at all the possible places and all the possible ways that are available to us to use in order to teach or in order to, to provide environments where people can learn meaningful things. And, and wouldn't it be cool if our educational system was designed to stimulate learning instead of facilitating teaching? And wouldn't it be great if we could leave seminars or conferences like this with the feeling that we really learned something because we had spaces to to express what we needed to learn very personally, but we also had different possibilities of learning things in different ways. And, and wouldn't it be great if learning was actually enjoyable because it was relevant and it would, the, the way how it would be organized for us would make total sense in terms of where it takes place on what it is about and what it is that we want to achieve with it. And I think this is totally possible we just simply have to do it. Thank you. <laughs>